Welcome all. My name is Ted Helms. I'm the Executive Director of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce. I'm really very honored to, to hold this event. This is, I guess, now becoming a tradition where we uh, uh, work in conjunction with the Brazil Foundation uh, to give them an opportunity to meet with our members as well as for them to uh, have their own uh, gathering and to uh, and a pre pre dinner uh, event where we can really have a, a good discussion for the chamber uh, we're very proud to, to always be able to help contribute to understanding of, of Brazil uh, all the various aspects of it whether it be political economic cultural education so for this this is a great opportunity uh, I think I'm going to simply uh, stop there welcome you all and hand it over to uh, Patricia who's going to uh, manage uh, this event. Thank you. thank you so much, Ted, and thank you so much to the team of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce. We are members of the chamber for since inception, pretty much, and we are extremely grateful, Ted, for, for you for hosting us here today. Um, tomorrow is our 16th annual gala in New York, so Brazil Foundation for those who are new, we are 18 years old. We were established in the year 2000. And our founder, Leona Foreman, her goal was to create a philanthropic bridge between Brazilians here who wanted to contribute to Brazil and be able to donate to various projects in Brazil at advancing education or health, culture, socioeconomic development, and, and have uh, tax deduction here and uh, and also, we work very closely with the projects we fund to make sure the resources are well invested and the results are meaningful. So tomorrow is our 16th gala. Our galas celebrate philanthropy. So tomorrow we'll be celebrating both people who contribute to Brazil as donors. So we have the honor of honoring tomorrow the Garcia Family Foundation. And we also recognize the work of social entrepreneurs working on the ground to advance education and opportunity in Brazil. So I'm going to call um, our speakers. We're going to do this panel in two parts. First, we're going to talk about, we're celebrating the Amazon. We're going to talk with Rita and Tiago. And then we're going to call the Garcias and have a conversation with them about philanthropy. So. Uh, please come, Rita and Tiago. So the Amazon, so not a lot of people realize, but they, can you hear me? Yes. So the Amazon forest covers almost 60% of Brazil's territory. So it's vast, it's a vast region. And uh, you know, it's also home to 25 million people, including 200 indigenous communities. But um, a lot of people talk about deforestation or conservation, lot, lots of international organizations addressing the issue of conservation, but we are here today mostly to talk about the people, about education. Um, there are many issues in the Amazon, including uh, very poor educational attainment, very high illiteracy rates, in some parts of the, in the state of Amazonas, for instance, uh, almost 40% of the population depend on welfare, on the Bolsa Familia. So um, many of the problems we fund are addressing education, income generation, and, uh, and socioeconomic opportunity um, on the ground. So I'm extremely proud to introduce you to Rita Teixeira. She is a community Minefa. Minefa is Movimento de Mulheres do Nordeste do Pará. She works with 60 women groups in the northern part of the state across 14 municipalities. And uh, providing, uh, so Rita was the daughter of family farmers. She has been involved with Minefa for over 20 years. And uh, Minepa's mission is to provide tools to women in the Northeast of Pará to overcome social inequalities. The organization promotes sustainable development, social justice, gender equality uh, to all these groups of women. And one of the biggest focuses is economic and financial 
uh, literacy and uh, opportunity. So I'd like to show you a two minutes video about uh, Mineta's work. Meu nome é Rita Auxiliadora Teixeira. Eu sou natural da cidade de Castanhal, mas é, morei em Santa Maria há 22 anos e há 27 estou em Capanema. A Rita é uma mulher sonhadora, uma mulher que é persistente, mulher negra, filha de agricultores analfabetos, mas que não desiste nunca de ser feliz e lutar pelos objetivos e do que acha que é correto. Hoje a gente está em 14 municípios do Pará. A gente tem em torno de 60 grupos de mulheres, em média é entre 17 e 20 mulheres em cada grupo. E hoje a principal linha de atuação, de fortalecimento, é a econômica a financeira dos grupos de mulheres. Por quê? Porque a gente percebeu, num diagnóstico que nós fizemos há uns anos atrás, que a mulher que consegue gerar renda, então a mulher que tem autonomia financeira, ela não aceita ser espancada, ela não aceita ser explorada, ela não aceita uma série de coisas. A gente avançou e, querem, e continua querendo avançar mais nessa questão financeira. E aí o que, que nós fizemos? Nós criamos um instrumental chamada caderneta agroecológica. Essa caderneta, ela possibilita que a mulher anote o que ela consome dentro da família, do lote que ela trabalha, o que ela vende, o que ela doa e o que ela troca. Entendeu? Então, essa caderneta agroecológica, ela vem, ela tem o um objetivo de mostrar que nós temos produção, de mostrar que a, sustenta, que, que a nossa produção é capaz de, de, de manter uma casa. Sozinha nós não somos nada, mas com essas mulheres a gente é tudo o que a gente quiser. É isso. I also have the pleasure of introducing Thiago Cavalli Zambuja. He was born in Campo Grande, actually. He studied in Sao Paulo at UCI. But in 2009, he visited the Amazon, fell in love with the Tupana River, where he eventually settled down. And so, with the help from friends, local residents, he restored an abandoned house near the Santa Isabel community in Careiro. And then Casa do Rio was born. So the, the, the house began as a residence for artists who wanted to share their experiences in the region. But then Thiago became concerned with the challenges he saw in the community, especially the high number of youth without access to education. So he decided to take action and he created Casa do Rio in 2014. Today, Casa do Rio creates and executes projects to strengthen local governance, conservation and autonomy for the people in the Amazon. He works along the BR-319, one of the most endangered areas of the forest. So we have also a video about Casa do Rio. Here. A Casa do Rio funciona como uma plataforma de projetos que mira a construção de uma sociedade sustentável. Nós desenvolvemos projetos a partir das potencialidades respeitando as vertentes culturais, sociais e ambientais da região. Estabelecemos parcerias com atores de diversas áreas, promovendo o encontro do saber local com o conhecimento científico. Deste, surgem os elementos necessários para estabelecer uma sociedade onde ser, natureza e tecnologia convivem dentro dos princípios da sustentabilidade. dia eu compreendo que vale a pena. Quando se falava de empreendedorismo aqui, a gente não dava tanta importância. Né? Então isso motivou bastante a gente, né? A gente só está regando saber que ele já tem, né? E como regar com alfabetização. Eu participo do projeto do Tessun. A gente tece, faz o corpo, faz a peneira, faz a bolsa. O Tessun mudou muita coisa na minha vida e quero aprender mais. Se tornar independente é, financeiramente, a transformação pode ser muito grande, né?
So uh, let's start with uh, Tiago. This uh, last weekend, on Folha de São Paulo had an article about BR 319. So this road <laughs> is the road that links Manaus to Porto Velho. So it's a link between south and north and diagonally in Brazil. And it is where the deforestation is really happening in the fastest pace. So uh, let's first talk a little bit about the region, about some of the challenges that you see. Can you talk a little bit about you know, what's going on in the state of Amazonas and especially in the region that where you work? government and this road collapsed because it stayed it stayed for years without any repairs or meditation and this all of these years and this population got isolated for around 30 years and since 2010 the road it's open again so all the the movement is it's part of uh, part of a, we have some movement, but not all this potential that the road can can bring. And in the south of this road, we have the state of Rondonia, where all the madeiras, I don't know, uh, all the madeiras, the soya plantations, it's on the south of this road. So this, the all of this movement is coming up the road and we are on the north part of the road. So right now, we see many people moving from the south of the road to the north of this road. So this is what I've been passing through, like a lot of people coming to the area, and we haven't seen, we have, see, uh, have, we have, we have been seeing this movement, but we haven't seen uh, developments, uh, support from the part of the government. So we are the only institution working in this area, the small institution working in this area, and it's considered the most in danger area for conservation right now. So, but also when the road reopened, especially since 2015, a lot of new problems came to the region for the youth, including drug trafficking, that wasn't there before in the levels that it is it is today, and um, so, and also, in the past decade and a half, I think the Brazilian government closed 40,000 rural schools. Is that correct? Yes. So, so in remote areas of the country, a lot of places there are no more schools. I, I visited a community where I saw the building of the schools, but there are no teachers. So, can we talk a little bit about the lack of access to education, and what are you doing to address that? Well, uh, I started working with the uh, community with education. Like when I arrived and built the house, we figured out that the, the youth, like there were like around like 20 teenagers with no access to school. So we started like a, a small school in the porch of the house. Um, during the weekends, they used to come to, to the house, stay uh, Saturday and Sunday stay, and then they used to go back to school to their families. That was the the frame we found that moment we arrived, and we've been seeing through these years since like we started this in 2011, and we've been seeing that not much has changed. Like uh, the schools still have problems with like access to teachers. 
because usually they don't they have to come from the from the villages the local government give no support to them to stay in the community so sometimes they just like okay you have to go to that community over there get your stuff and go so the framing has like the, usually this the students uh, the teachers they stay for one or two months in the community and then they left and they, and they, they leave because they can can't stay there there's no structure one of the things we're doing is like we are trying to give support for the people from the community to become teachers so that we can <coughs> they can stay there and then we can guarantee that the, the school won't close. Uh, we are also trying to... We're building a school in a community, it's in a, in a conservation area, where we want to make up this school, this model for, for schools in the... that in rural areas for the Amazon. We're trying to start into this process of developing this methodology with the local teachers from them, from, uh, from their difficulties and from their challenges they have. So we're getting, we're getting together a group of people like educators, uh, artists, that would help us in developing this school. Like we're sending them to schools in Sao Paulo, there are like uh, uh, references in new education. And we're having some problems like with the government because like the local government change, changed and then like uh, we had to stop the, the we had to stop the, the building of the school, the process and now like we're getting back, we're giving a turn and uh, rebuilding it again uh, and with the teenagers like that we work in the village because we also like we've been accompanying those students those children that we are working in Tupana now they're going to university this year so we've been following them all the way through the university and most of them are living in the nearest village where we created a center like uh, we call like Centro de Saberes da Floresta, which is a place for collectives and people to use it. And it's like an innovation center for this youth from this village where we make like a lot of projects like communication, education, and other things to, to support those, those youth in the, in the village. So I think let's talk a little bit about Pará, Rita. Ele falou um pouco sobre, a, sobre o estado do Amazonas, um pouco sobre os desafios do que está acontecendo na BR e um pouco do que, que o trabalho que você conhece muito bem, porque você já foi lá, do que ele está fazendo com, com os jovens, com as crianças e no Centro de Saberes. Mas, é, eu, she's going to speak in Portuguese and I'll translate after. Uh, Rita, conta um pouco para a gente sobre o Pará. Né? O, no estado do Pará, a floresta, já, boa parte dela já foi, né? Fala um pouco sobre o contexto no qual o, o Minerva atua né, em 14 municípios, com 60 grupos de mulheres, eixos principais de é, autonomia financeira, o eixo econômico. Conta um pouquinho sobre uh, o contexto que você vê no, no estado do Pará e um pouco de, do trabalho do Minerva. Bom dia. É, primeiro dizer, pedir desculpa para vocês por não falar inglês mas não tive a oportunidade de estudar é, muito cedo tive que trabalhar na agricultura com meus pais né? e não me envergonho de dizer que a minha vida começou desse jeito porque a gente pegou a força da mãe terra para mudar a situação em que a gente vivia e leva isso para a vida toda. Só consegui me formar é, como assistente social há três anos atrás. She apologizes for not speaking in English. She comes from humble backgrounds. She's the daughter of uh, family farmers who couldn't read or write. And she could only finish college three years ago. É, o contexto do Pará a gente já não tem mais floresta. 
muito pouco a floresta que a gente tem no Pará. A exploração de madeira é, foi muito grande, desordenada, né? sempre foi. E, e vocês já devem ter acompanhado como as pessoas matam por terra no Pará. Né? E um caso que foi de comoção nacional foi a morte da Dorothy, né? que a gente sabe que é de uma outra região, mas a Dorothy se articulava com a gente, com o nosso movimento. So, uh, most of the forest in the state of Pará is already gone. There's been a lot of wood, wood logging, how do I say? I should have known better how to translate the madeireiras, but the wood cutting has been very intense in the past decades and completely disorganized and unregulated. So, um, the wood, Uh, cutting activities in the past decades already took most of the forest, but also um, it is a state where there's a lot of violence concerning land disputes, uh, and she mentioned the assassination of the Dorothy, who, who was, um, I think, an environmentalist. You know, we, I think the world uh, remembers that story. A, a região de atuação do Minepa são 60 grupos de mulheres, especificamente mulheres agricultoras, trabalhadoras rurais, quilombolas. E o nosso trabalho é muito de reconstrução, recuperação de solo né, e o empoderamento das mulheres através do que ela tem no seu lote, né, na sua agricultura. So a lot of the work that they do with the 60 women's groups, most of them are small family farmers. And the work that they do, um, some of them is to recover the soil. The soil is exhausted, so they, they teach a lot of uh, agroecology techniques. And um, also they try to promote, like, make the women see uh, the value of her production and uh, make so she can make the most about the lot and of, of land that, that she has and you know provide for the family. Região do Pará é uma região é, onde o feminicídio é muito grande, mas a nossa região a gente conseguiu reduzir em 26% essa questão do feminicídio, da violência contra as mulheres, a partir desse trabalho de conscientização e de empoderamento. As mulheres na nossa região dizem o seguinte, é, que, que eu pagando a conta, quem senta na minha mesa é quem eu quero. <risos> Entendeu? Então, elas não aceitam é, viver e conviver com violência. Pará é, historicamente, um dos estados no Brasil com os níveis mais altos de violência contra as mulheres e as mulheres assassinações. But she was able to reduce in her region the levels of violence by 26%. Uh, and that has to do a lot of the, the work that she does in terms of um, economic empowerment of the women. Uh, once the women understand the value of she produces, she can choose whoever she shares the household with. I hope I translated well. <laughs> Então, é, o nosso trabalho é esse, é de mostrar para as mulheres que elas têm potencial, de que elas são capazes de, de transformar o espaço que elas estão vivendo. Né? Então, a gente é, dialoga com elas. Às vezes, elas estão em estado de violência e acham que não têm capacidade de sair daquele, daquela situação porque dependem economicamente do marido, do companheiro. E a gente, através do nosso trabalho de empoderamento com as mulheres, a gente mostra que é possível. E a gente conta muito a história de mulheres como eu, né? que, que vi lá de uma família onde meu pai e minha mãe são analfabetos, a minha mãe hoje assina o nome dela porque eu ensinei para ela quando eu tinha 12 anos. E a gente não aceitou viver dessa forma. Então, é, a gente tem o poder de transformar o espaço onde a gente mora. So she's talking about the capacity of each of these women to transform the environment of where they live. She gave an example. She, her parents were illiterate, but when she was 12 years old, she taught her mother to write her name. Uh, so they believe that they each are responsible for transforming their environment. Um, 
But one of the other things that Minepa does, and she didn't mention yet, is reforestation, they work with beekeeping. Rita, vocês também têm, uh, além da agricultura, e eu quero ainda que você conte um pouco sobre a caderneta agroecológica, vocês têm um trabalho de criação de abelhas nativas, uh, produção de mel e, e reflorestamento, e mudas e recuperação do solo. Você pode falar um pouco sobre a atividade econômica e, e, e sustentável e o que, que vocês estão fazendo também para recuperar um pouco do bioma da região ali onde vocês moram? É, como eu falei no início, a nossa região é desmatada, então o nosso trabalho é duas vezes, que a gente tem que recuperar o solo. E para isso o Minepa distribuiu nos últimos três anos mais de 150 mil mudas de plantas né, da floresta, como andiroba, copaíba e outras mudas, mas também medicinais porque a gente quer fazer com que as mulheres se apropriem desse conhecimento das pessoas que são mais idosas da família e sair muito do remédio da farmácia comprado, mesmo porque elas estão longe dos centros da cidade. Então esse trabalho de recuperação do, do solo também é, é de recuperação dos saberes dessas mulheres. Né? A gente, porque o que acontece muito das pessoas irem lá estudantes, inclusive de outros países, se apropriam do conhecimento, conversam, que a gente é sempre assim, muito falante, os paraenses, as amazônidas, entrega tudo que a gente sabe, né? e as pessoas não voltam para devolver o que elas conseguiram extrair da gente através da academia. So she, she said that in terms of recovering the soil and reforestation, Minepa has distributed 150,000 Vamos falar muda seedlings, não. Seedlings of uh, native trees like copaiba or andiroba for, for the women to, to replant and they have to, before having a productive uh, agriculture production, they have to recover the soil, but they are not just recovering the soil and the forest itself, but also the ancient knowledge, the medicinal properties of these plants that most of them have already patents from other countries, like a lot of the U.S. universities have patented the, the local uh, species, but the, the, the local people not always know about the properties and the, the, the use of these um, native trees and, and plants, so she's trying to also recover the, this ancient knowledge. Uh, but now I'd like to talk, uh, ask you guys a question about collaboration because um, one, of the, one of the things that Brazil Foundation does, besides funding projects with uh, financial resources, it also invests in, um, in technical support, mentoring for, for the, the project leaders, but we invest in knowledge by peer-to-peer collaboration so that they learn from themselves so uh, a few years ago uh, we funded a collaboration between Minepa and Casa do Rio. Thiago, can you tell us a little bit about this collaboration? Perguntei para eles sobre a parceria de vocês. Yes, we, we met in 2014 when the first support we got from the Brazil Foundation. I met Rita there and in 2015 we brought her to to Careiro to start talking to the women we were working there and life has never been the same <laughs> since then. Like a, she has like a very powerful work with women, like really, really, really powerful. And in um, 2016, or 17, or, uh, I think it was 2016, we did this collaboration where we introduced the native bee that we saw the, the little girl here saying about in our territory. So since then we've been working on that with another collaborators now, but she opened this, this, this world for us. And she comes like maybe three times a year. Yeah. She comes around like three times a year for our region to work with the women. And this has been 
really one of our proud like uh, the work she's been doing with the women there. Rita, você quer comentar sobre a colaboração com a Casa do Rio? Como tem sido para você? É um aprendizado, né? Porque apesar da gente estar na mesma região, é, são costumes, é uma outra realidade. Então, essa troca de conhecimento foi muito importante, porque em cada lugar que a gente vai, em cada espaço que a gente vai, a gente aprende. Né, com qualquer pessoa que você dialogue, então as mulheres da região que o Tiago atua, atua tem uma força interna muito grande. Elas só precisam ser lapidadas, né? só precisam de alguém que dê um impulso, que ajude, que colabore, que elas conseguem andar com, a, com as próprias pernas. Eu acho que isso é uma característica das, das pessoas que moram na Amazônia, porque a cada dia a gente tem que se superar. A gente tem que correr atrás, porque a vida não é fácil. Né? São grandes projetos, são exploração, e que a gente, a cada dia, tem que estar se renovando, se alimentando, para poder ir superando as desigualdades e a falta de tudo. So she said it has been a learning process to collaborate with uh, Casa do Rio. They are in the same region, but each of the locations have different costumes, different habits. So, but she sees in the women of the Amazonas the same strength and potential that she sees in the women of Pará. And uh, she says this, these women are like rocks that have a lot of internal power but need to be lapidated. But uh, the way we see it as, as funders, you know, Chango really started with the education, with the, the Casa do Rio started as a school, and he didn't have much knowledge uh, in terms of um, the economic and power of women's groups, and Hita has been working for over 20 years exactly with this. So to bring Hita there, to work with the economic compo component of with the families, and uh, especially the women, has been uh, a way that she she had um, the experience with this. So why not, you know, share? So this is something that uh, Brazil Foundation tries to promote, you know, reduce overlap, but uh, really create synergies between the, the different projects that we fund. And then before we open for questions, um, I, the last question is about the role of philanthropy. So um, a lot of the, the challenges that we see in the, edu in the region, education or, or policy, you know, what is the role of philanthropy or in private funding in terms of the work that you are doing? Rita, estou perguntando assim, qual seria a importância do investimento de recursos do tipo do que a Brasil Foundation investe, mas recursos privados, né? Obviamente que o governo tem responsabilidade, que é do governo, mas o, é, no que o financiamento independente, no que isso, no que isso ajuda o trabalho que vocês estão fazendo? Do you, you want to start about talking about? É, é fundamental, Patrícia. O primeiro apoio da Brasil Foundation ao Minepa foi para formação de conselheiros e conselheiras para atuar dentro da fiscalização dos recursos públicos que entram no município. E, e essa capacitação foi feita através de módulos, foram cinco módulos para mulheres lideranças. E essa capacitação, ela nos qualificou a atuar nesse espaço com qualidade, sabendo qual é o papel de um conselheiro e uma conselheira dentro do, dos conselhos de saúde, de educação, de agricultura, de meio ambiente. Com isso, nós conseguimos algumas inimizades. Por quê? Porque a gente não aceitou assinar as prestações de contas de muitas coisas que a gente sabia que não estava acontecendo no município. Eu sempre falo para o Tiago, a gente é amado por uns e odiado por outros. Mas isso não deixa a gente desanimar nunca. She mentioned something I even didn't remember. The very first grant we gave to her more than 10 years ago was for capacity building of city council men and women to uh, audit the public spending. Now, Brazil has a long history of corruption. So basically, they refused to sign off on things of, on the, the, the cities that they knew, you know, the, the, were not 
existing in real life. So basically, they she said they created some enemies, but it's very important. So this civic participation, I think the country can only overcome the, the, the corruption when citizens understand their role when they are, you know, basically articulated in, you know, and interested in basically auditing and mas não foi só isso, né? A gente aprovou outras coisas. Aproveitar, Patrícia, para agradecer, né? Agradecer, porque esse foi o primeiro de muitos outros que vieram depois, né? É, dentro desse apoio que a gente teve da Brasil Foundation, a gente implementou o trabalho com a apicultura. Nós temos oito grupos de mulheres que trabalham com o mel e derivados do mel a própolis, a cera violada e muitos outros produtos, balinha de mel. Conseguimos colocar na alimentação escolar o mel né, para as crianças. Vendemos para o PA e para o PNAI, que são é, programas do governo, né, tanto municipal, estadual quanto federal. É, outros projetos também apoiados pela Brasil Foundation nos possibilitou é, capacitar as mulheres na produção de mudas, porque elas precisam saber como produzir as mudas e muda de qualidade. Recuperamos quatro nascentes que já estavam mortas há mais de 10 anos, onde passava muito pouquinha água. A gente conseguiu reflorestar. Então, assim, Patrícia, aqui, muito obrigada por confiar e acreditar no trabalho da gente. So, some of the other projects we funded had to do with beekeeping. Uh, so, there are eight women's groups that were uh, now that produce honey and they have access to markets. They sell uh, through to government pro uh, programs, but also they, they produce um, candies with honey and all kinds of other things. And uh, another project we funded uh, was more related to reforestation. They were able to recover four nascentes streams. So four water streams by, by replanting. So it's an important work that they are doing uh, in the region in several aspects, you know, in conservation and in income generation and you know, and, and civic engagement and, and rights and it's, both of them have very complex line of works and development. When you talk about social economic development, it's really everything. It's education, it's income, it's health, it's participation. So there's, and I think they both have very strong projects. So Chi, what's the role of philanthropy? It's essential, <laughs> I would say, because like a, we have no support from government. So, and we don't have freedom to work as the way we believe if you work with government so philanthropy it's essential uh, we've been very glad to work with brazil foundation because it's it gives us such a liberty to work freedom to work because sometimes you're in a project and then you see an opportunity go onto this side and you just can you move this way <laughs> And so we have this freedom to work with Brazil Foundation. The Brazil Foundation has been the main institution supporting us in the, 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 since the beginning, 2014. Uh, and there's uh, a place like in that we have the we have to we need the chance to experience like uh, in, when you work with communities because sometimes the opportunity is there and to make it to make it work and to bring it to in, into a project with uh, the particip participation to the community takes some time sometimes and it takes some time and it's philanthropy is the only way we can do it actually like because otherwise we have no no way to to do it, especially in the Amazon. Like uh, we're very isol iso isolated, and sometimes, for example, I stay in like <coughs> three to three months into community, so we have no contact with outside, and it's very important. Philanthropy is the only way. 
and our finishing, like uh, <laughs> yes, because we have to also talk about uh, the season. So I think we have time for one or two questions, but then we're going to expand on the conversation about the role of philanthropy with the Garcias and the, you know how, from the perspective of the funder, you know how can we create impact in Brazil and the world through you know focus and purposeful philanthropy. So um, anybody has any questions? Then add. Uh, I was just wondering if it's if it's possible to um, expand a little bit more on the role of the government because Hita, I, I know um, there has been some support with the government in terms of the work that you do. Um, I was wondering what importance the government has for Hita the possibilities of in the future working in the government, with the government for, for your project. Um, and two, I wanted to know in terms of uh, all of the activity, all of the supports that you provide, which of the activities um, have proved, um, have given the most results uh, to you? Rita, ele perguntou duas coisas, né? A gente está falando sobre filantropia, mas ele, o, o Thiago não recebe nenhum apoio do governo, mas você já tem parceria, teve parcerias com o governo. Ele queria saber exatamente qual é o papel do governo no seu caso, do, do seu projeto, e de todos os projetos que você realiza, qual aquele que você acha que teve o, me, o resultado mais importante? É, o Brasil é a terra do Tinha, né? Teve, mas hoje não tem mais. E o melhor apoio que nós tivemos, Bernardo, e que foi muito importante para a gente, foi o, o que estava dentro da Secretaria de Política para as Mulheres. E não existe mais. Né? E a gente está sofrendo no Brasil perdas de direitos, né? conquistado pela gente com muito suor, lágrimas, e a gente está percebendo que com essa eleição agora, eu acho que a gente ainda vai perder muito mais. Mas um dos projetos foi com a Secretaria de Meio Ambiente, que foi o trabalho com as abelhas com ferrão. Né? Então, ele foi importante para a gente porque estava tendo muita queimada nas comunidades e acabando o resto dos igarapés, rios que a gente tinha. Então nós começamos a trabalhar apicultura, porque se você trabalha com apicultura, você não pode queimar, porque na hora que você queima, as abelhas vão embora. E elas estavam gerando muita renda para as famílias. Então a gente conseguiu acabar a queimada da nossa região com o trabalho das abelhas. E aí a gente incentivou, porque para as abelhas se alimentarem, elas precisam de plantas. Então a gente fez uma pesquisa e viu qual tipo de planta que era mais viável para a nossa região que ainda a gente não tinha nos lotes. E aí a gente é, conseguiu reflorestar. Foi assim que a gente também começou o trabalho com reflorestamento. Tudo através de uma estratégia para poder inibir as queimadas que estavam muito grandes. She said one of the most impactful projects was uh, the beekeeping, that she had partnership with the secretary of, of the environment. And um, the, the region was having a lot of queimadas when you, when you want to, to plant, you basically burn down, burn out, burn <laughs> the plot. And then if you are, um, you know, if you have a, a bee, beekeeping activities, you cannot burn down the land because it, the bees are going to fly away. So basically the, the beekeeping was generating a lot of income for the local families and that stopped the practice of the queimadas uh, because of, of, of the honey production and, and the beekeeping. One more question before we move on. Regina. Vocês já sofreram, enquanto, como vocês, alguma ameaça, porque a gente sabe que essa é uma área, como você citou, perigosa, existe essa ameaça que a gente vê em, sabe, contra algum, algum de vocês, like, pessoalmente, assim, existe essa... É, em 96, foi assassinada uma coordenadora do Minepa, na sala da casa dela, na frente de dois filhos uma menina de seis anos e um, rapaz, um menino de nove anos. 
E na mesma época, todas nós que estávamos à frente do Minepa recebemos carta de ameaça. Morreu a Regiane e três outras, e eu, uma das três, recebemos carta dizendo que o que tinha acontecido com ela podia acontecer com a gente, que a gente parasse com o que a gente estava fazendo. E naquele momento foi uma denúncia que nós fizemos que os governos municipais aumentaram o número da população para receber verba. Então, fizeram, é, mandaram informações erradas para o IBGE. E nós denunciamos. E nós passamos quatro meses sem nenhuma ação no movimento, só reuniões muito pequenas, fechadas, dizendo o que, é que nós íamos fazer como era que a gente ia tocar. E depois de quatro meses nós dissemos, se tiver que morrer, vai morrer, mas nós não vamos parar o trabalho do Minep. She had asked if she ever suffered any threats, and she said yes, in 96, uh, one of the coordinators of the movement was assassinated in the living room of her home, in front of her two children, and then other three women in the group, including Hita, received uh, life threats. And the reason why they basically denounce corruption in the city and, and the municipalities. But then after four months, they decided that if they have to die, they will die, but they will not stop this work that they believe is important. So, é um exemplo de coragem para nós, mulheres. Um, we're going to have more questions at the end, but we need also. Uh, continue to talk about the role of philanthropic calling here. Um, the Garcias, we are going to be honoring tomorrow. Rita, muito obrigada, Thiago, muito obrigada. Acho que a gente ainda tem muito que conversar, mas depois a gente volta para mais perguntas para quem quiser e puder ficar mais. Mas a gente precisa também bater um papo com Renata e com Cláudio. Então, obrigada. and honored to call here Renata and Claudio Garcia. Um, so philanthropy has two sides. Uh, one side, two, two important examples here this morning are social entrepreneurs, community leaders doing work on the ground, promoting economic inclusion and education uh, in the various regions that they work. But this is also only possible because of the funds, you know, because of people who believe that philanthropy is important. So I'm extremely honored to introduce to you Claudia and Renata Garcia, founders of the Garcia Family Foundation, which is an example of a new generation of philanthropists in Brazil. Um, I don't know if you know, um, Brazil is the eighth largest economy in the world. But in philanthropy, we rank number 75. So the United States gives 2% of GDP. The Latin American average 0.4%. And Brazil gives 0.2%. So um, there is a, I think Brazil has a long journey to go in terms of catching up. Some of these, uh, the barriers are laws, but also some of the barriers are cultural. So, um, but nonetheless, despite challenges, philanthropy in Brazil is developing. This week, a few days ago, there was an important moment in terms of legislation. President Temer signed a law making endowments legal in Brazil. So, for over two years, the Senate was discussing a law that makes endowments recognized by Brazilian laws. Nothing was, there was no rush to make, push this law forward, but then the museum burned down, and then people started discussing uh, how can we make insti cultural institution thrive, so endowments could be a way. So there is now a new piece of legislation, finally, that went through because of a uh, catastrophe. Um, but Claudio and Renata, you, know, you, um, you have been donors for many, to many causes for several years, but you only established your foundation in 2015, correct? The, you, so, um, and uh, among the things that they do, they fund projects both in the United States and in Brazil. 
Some of the projects that they fund here include cultural projects. I don't know how many of you here went to the Elisha Papi exhibition at the Met. Anyone who went? So they was, were one of the sponsors. I don't know if anybody here went to the Elio Chisica exhibition uh, at the Whitney. They also one of the sponsors. They invest in scholarships here locally in the US but they haven't lost sight of Brazil and some of their investments are very robust in education so we're gonna we have a lot to ask uh, but the first question um, a little bit about uh, the, the history of your foundation why did you incorporate the, the, the foundation formally you know um, um, and also what motivates you to give and how do you select your projects Well, I think that so usually Hello. Uh, if it's not working, I'll let him answer. <laughs> so uh, first of all, thank you for having us here. And also, uh, thank you for calling us the new generation. I'm not sure about the new, but you know, we've been doing philanthropy for a long time. Uh, but usually for a very specific projects and uh, in 2015 we realized it was time to get our kids involved and so we thought about you know let's do it officially have a foundation and bring them as soon as possible to our projects well it's gonna be soon considering they have nine and eleven years old so we you know it's start young um, then since 2015 we've been working basically on education art and projects Brazil and United States, as you said, um, and uh, how do you choose the projects? Like a little bit of, of the, the criteria, you know, why invest in this project and not the other? So what's the rationale when you decide to fund something? We based, when we started in 2015, we kept the projects that we're already doing. Uh, one with like Brazil Foundation and like Igor da Silva and the health, and then we started to move through education and uh, art. I think the only we have the ties with Brazil. The only way to change things in Brazil are through education. So we decided to focus on education and do scholarships and do and learn what is going on in Brazil, public education, private in the United States and start to find a way to combine both and see what we can do to change. Uh, well, I think it's interesting also is the, uh, we created here because of my income, our income comes from the US, so the fiscally there are advantages when you, you don't need. But you can have that advantage as a person or the foundation. The foundation was our desire for perpetuity. Mm -hmm for the kids to contaminate mm -hmm. friends and kids <laughs> to do the same, right? So if they understand the value, etc., and uh, a lot of the things flow through the foundation because we want the foundation to be there for a long time after we, we are promoted. So uh, let's talk a little bit about education. But um, beyond funding projects, like, let's talk a little bit about projects in Brazil. We have one of them here, IPTE, Lana Fontes. Just... Sonia here from EPTE, but um, a, one of the robust investments you made was Ensina Brasil. And Ensina Brasil is basically Teach for America. In, uh, the technology you know, is, is in Brazil. Um, do you work with your grantees in terms of mentoring or do you go on the ground to visit with the leaders? And what is your involvement with the projects you fund beyond signing the check. Uh, in Brazil, I met Erika Beto is the founder. She, her mother is total, was illiterate. She fought a lot for her education. The time I first met her six years ago, she was finishing her MBA at Berkeley. And she wanted to, still in the doubt to what to do, she didn't want to do anything for profit. She wanted to do something that moved the needle in education. She was totally in love with the Teach for America for creating alumni of people involved in the project. So, and, uh, and I was always a little bit, I believe in, in <laughs> I didn't know that her very well, and it was impressive what she did from nothing. She created something, she made a kind of agreement with all the central states for the Midwest 
of Brazil to be able to do the program. She recruited the kids from the best schools, so I was impressed by the quality of the the recent graduates from Brazil that uh, agreed to go to Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, to spend two years teaching in public schools over there. And, and I like the the kind of people transformation when you see the reality of teaching in the school in the very remote locations with no resource. So I was excited and also I we tried to hire all these kids that fell in love for education to do other things in different parts of Brazil. So in a way is a great uh, multiplication effect of this kid. So, but it's also a, it's a huge investment on them as well. So they have to, if they finish engineering course at the at the Poly of the Wuchu in Brazil, we have to. If they stay two years in the program, but one year they have to be online training to become uh, qualified teachers for the kids. And then they spend two years in this experience. So I, I met. I go to the year convention where I see the kind of after one year living through that you are a different person and I love to think to see the things where things happen I think create different individuals right? I think the world is full of useless powerpoints <laughs> and not people that really go where the thing happens right? so, the, so the question was you are in, so then involved hands on you've met with the, the people that are the teachers and uh, this this project in Sina Brasil is very interesting because we heard from Tiago there was a school there but no teachers. So in rural areas of Brazil sometimes you have the building, no teachers, or the teacher comes and they want to stay. And then so in a country like Brazil, like, like, it, people don't want to become teachers because teachers are not valued. In this program in Sina, I think they have 15 candidates per spot or something like that, or more, 100, I, I don't even remember the name, the number, but it's a, um, you basically, you, you go teach in a public school in a remote area of Brazil for two years, making the salary of that the government pays for a teacher in Brazil, which is 2,000 reais in dollars, $500 a month, and there are brilliant kids willing to do that. So this program is possible because of funders like uh, Claudio and Renata. So uh, I actually met you all in scenes. I was so impressed myself. It is, you know, brilliant investment that you we made. A project is very strong. It's still, I think, early stages. Lots of room to grow. They, they need to send teachers to the Amazon region. <laughs> they need to, to um, uh, definitely a lot to be done. Uh, but Hinata, in terms of the cultural investments, no, no, we saw in, in Brazil the, the museum burning down and because of not just funds, but lack of proper governance, you know, the, in the, uh, how did the collaboration with the Whitney and the Matt came to be? Can you talk a little bit about that? And then what is the importance also for Brazil? Because it's not just supporting the Met, but really giving visibility to, to the Brazilian art. You know, what is the relationship with Brazil? Well, for both <coughs> projects, they found us. So they came to us and explained, we have this project uh, for the Little Pape. It was, it's just going to be the first women, you know, exposing at the, the Met and well, Brazilian. Uh, and then why we would not, you know, support it. And now on our part was, we usually, we're so used to only have like bad news about Brazil that we want to show, you know, what Brazil has the best to offer. So we have so many good artists, we have like the arts like coming, and why not just support what is good instead of talking about the bad things that happen to us like the music. So. Good. And um, since Lara Fontes is here, can you also talk a little bit about IPTI, which is a project that I personally visited. I went to Sajip, I see what they are doing on the ground. It's, it's like what Tiago is doing. There's an education component, there's an income component for, for the women artisans. So there, it's a, also a complex project that spans way beyond the municipality of Santa Lucia. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your role in funding projects like IPT. So since we do basically arts, culture, and education, and we try to focus on projects that we can uh, be involved and know about the results and get reports, 
and the EPTA is one that he, they combine, like the art, the culture, and education. So it's like a global uh, project, and they send like a uh, report. When I talk to them about the project, I told we like to be involved. We like, we like to be informed, right? So we would like. We haven't been there yet, but we like to have like the opportunity to go. We have to see like what is the results, what is going, what is the commitment of the board, what it, what are you doing, and what are you expecting in return. And one of the criteria, as you asked in the beginning, was you know how do you choose? So NDPT was one of the projects that they presented us exactly what we're looking for. So. Um, when I asked you about like, why did you formalize uh, the foundation, and, and your answer was because of the kids, the next generation and, and legacy. So what does legacy look like? Like, What do you would like to accomplish or see accomplished in the next five or uh, ten years? And uh, what do you envision your, like, how do you want your kids to be involved when they grow a little older? Um, uh, specifically for the education and for the scholarships that we fund, uh, usually we, the candidates they do an essay and they send to us so we can participate and choose. Uh, I read this essays to my kids so as they know, like no one other reality and why we do this, and I ask their opinion. So and why, why do you think it's important to have a scholarship? And you know, yes, even yesterday, uh, my son said, "Well, you know, everybody." deserves a chance to get a good education. So they are trying to understand, and I think our legacy was one day, not only our kids, but you know, our kids' family, and just like move. If you can only help one people, and these people have another and another, so it's just, just one. You choose one cause, and you help one people, and then you, your kids will know, and then you know, the friends will know, their kids will know, and then you just spread this idea for philanthropy, and just hoping that everybody will help and everybody will be so glad to help and uh, just like you no know, spreading give for it uh, and the example that you showed here happens a lot right? all these foundations non-profit they get together and uh, very difficult for one isolated to move the needle sometimes but when we do <laughs> complementary thing leveraging each other's strengths it's always something great happens so you look for collaboration also between the... Yeah. Now, now I'm, I'm trying to... Generations is a project that McKinsey created to create basically professional uh, work for people that just finished the uh, high school. And that's something I'm helping take into Brazil this year to start Generations Brazil. And uh, that's some of the... But I do together with other foundation, with the a lot of knowledge because the Instituto Pro already exists in Brazil focusing on that. A little bit different different approach, but uh, I, I like to Pro does six months of preparation for the kids to get into the job. McKinsey is bringing 12 weeks, so I'm interested to see how this partnership could, could help both of them, right? So, you know, Brazil needs more Garcias, no more people like you than uh, are really structuring their philanthropy, you know, with a lot of care. So, what advice do you can you give for for people? Uh, there are a lot, a lot of donors here tomorrow. I think uh, there'll be a lot of donors. But what advice would you give to a person trying to structure their philanthropic investments uh, a little better? I would say it just. Be specific, be more specific instead of just like in the beginning we were like, oh, we want to fund like all the projects and everything is so interesting, you just get lost some, somehow, but just like find your passion, find your cause and find something that you can like to be personally involved and learn about it, not only writing the check and um, not following up. Uh, yeah, focusing also is, is important. I think it's the project, how they measure impact, so what you don't measure, you don't manage. So all that I learned very early on in my life. And I think that the, if the person is willing to give their life for something, is a project that's worth bearing sometimes. <laughs> so so um, giving can be very rewarding. Sometimes you say that giving is um, better for the person giving than the person receiving is more rewarding. Can you share an, a, um, an interesting history or a person um, 
something that happened to you that could also inspire people in going on their philanthropic journeys or some a story of a beneficiary or something that was rewarding for you? Well, I, I love to sponsor extraordinary kids, right? This thing of scholarship in university and schools, etc. And there's a, there's a Tassiana, she is a, she comes from the south of Brazil. She her dream is to become a rugby player, but she's very short. But she almost made to the national Brazilian team of rugby. Then I didn't know that Brazil has a rugby team because we don't play rugby at all, right? So we just lose one. And uh, and she's such a fighter that she was. You no, know, I wanted to be in the rugby. She went to the rugby team. Then I want to do biomedicine at Harvard. So she passed into Harvard, etc. And then she, I remember that she once, two years ago, she, three years ago, she came to talk to me and said, oh. uh, and, and she, George Paulus also helps her, I help her, so several people help her. And then she, George, no, see if you have a job for her there at, at the beer business, etc. And I said, oh. And then I came to her, well, why, why, why do you want to? <laughs> you, you did bio, bioengineer or biomedicine, well, why are you going to work in the beer? I don't know, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm here because you guys are, then I give advice, guys, follow your passion and follow amazing people, right? So sometimes it's not the, the company that you work, it's the person that you follow that is important, right? To identify these key ones. And I'm very happy, I think her experience, and once we took the kids to, to know Harvard, uh, etc., and it was a weekend, and that's uh, that's what she she was there with us with our family and she almost became part of the family. I think this is a kind of a engagement that, that I like, right? That you see people really fighting adversities that we cannot even imagine, and I hope that educate my kids to become less spoiled, right? So because in a way, compared to those stories, ours are. She she was 12 when she decided to go to Harvard. She had never heard about Harvard. She applied, she got in. She's like brilliant. She's doing right now, she's working on a project to print um, organs on a 3D and to transplants and save lives. So. Beautiful. So questions, I have. we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Yes, Lydia? Yes, um, so with my experience in the third sector in Brazil, uh, a big challenge we had was to measure impacts, like when you work with education, when you, even like with health, like depending on the project, this is a big challenge for social organizations. And the kind of measurements in this uh, third sector is very different from the private sector. Like how do you deal with that when you are like funding projects and like, like you, you mentioned that a little bit about like measuring it. And um, it's very interesting, there, there is a TED talk of, of uh, Darren uh, Walker from uh, Ford Foundation, and he addresses it specifically that, how uh, philanthropists should be um, um, aware that it's very hard sometimes to measure the impact. And sometimes like you cannot show impact, and maybe if you do, you're gonna say, we don't need this project there, but how would it be if the project wouldn't be there? Like the, the results would be even worse. So how do you deal with that? Uh, I push for measurement big time, e even if the, sometimes, if we, there's a leap of faith that I give time to the great owner of the project to create metrics, because I believe that territory is gonna be good. But sometimes, uh, if I in Sina Brazil, when I sit with Erica, she shows me exactly the we have a group control of people that don't have these teachers or the kids that have the teacher. I see the grades before and after. I see how if we're losing any of the seniors or is it work? So because when we talk about the, the any donor would like to see tangible stuff, right? And there's, and this uh, is our responsibility as donors also to help. Because I don't want to be a passive, say you don't matter, I'm not interested in you. So now let's create something that really moves the needle and we can work together. And it doesn't need to be sophisticated. I, I'm okay to start with one <laughs> metric and then evolve, etc. I think we have to be open mind. But if you don't simulate in the in the non profit the thing of measuring there is already uh, the death sentence because nobody all the eight or nine 
big philanthropies in Brazil, or donors in Brazil would like to see metrics and impact. Uh, we do a lot of things now in Sino Integral in Brazil to convert the four hours to eight hours. Everything is measured, right? We have the IDEB, we have a lot of uh, absentee transfer. It takes a while to get the information, right? This thing of number of students in Brazil is a mess because nobody knows how many students we have. Because the, the more students you have, it's like what the example she gave, the more money you receive. So all the, the number of students are fake in Brazil because all, all the states, they, they, they create numbers that don't exist. So sometimes we think we have, no, we have a problem of lack of uh, classrooms. No, no, we don't have the information. We think we have 1,000, but we have 300 students. Any other questions? Yeah. Anthony? Okay. Uh, what was the breaking point in your life that you said, you know what, I'm going to now just uh, commit to, uh, what, what happened? Uh, no, uh, I, 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 I just, re I changed jobs now in the beginning of this year, but I, I'm still for profit half of my time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other half I'm no profit. She's 100% no profit. <laughs> So well, I do both. I, I like to, and some of the things that we do, uh, I like the system and uh, here in the US, the media network creates something that I think is amazing because it's a non-profit and for-profit working together. Because sometimes what I'm worried about non-profit is the, the kind of, uh, people, even non-profit can have great ambitions. So there, it, I, there is idealism by definition, that's 90% of the motivation. But uh, if you make money out of it, like it happens in the US, I think it's something that stimulates even more. I think sometimes the type of talent that you get when there is some kind of uh, money involved, I think it's good to the quality of the project that you're engaging, right? So, so I always try, in, in Brazil's mission impossible sometimes because of fiscal things. The fiscal issues are complicated. But I try to offer to the people that I work in non-profit, some for-profit, entrepreneurs for them to be able to swap and come and play, etc. I think this media is something that is really interesting, that I, I can be for profit and non-profit at the same time, right? So I think as human beings, I don't see any conflict. I just see positives on that. Uh, the Omidia Network is a pioneer in the world in social enterprise, impact investing, or the cost of society, so, which is something in between non-profit and for-profit, and there's a big trend. Virginia, question? Yeah, uh, uh, your example is amazing. For Brazil also. So my question would be more on, on the terms of uh, the philanthropy state, as Patricia said, Brazil is so poor, no? so unexistent. Uh, uh, my question is, do you have contact with uh, philanthropists in Brazil or with uh, an agency, for example, GIF, that is uh, that uh, congregates uh, philanthropists and uh, think about philanthropy in Brazil and try. Do you have any contact or exchange with uh, philanthropy in Brazil, or do you seek to? GIF is the Brazil Foundation. Yeah, GIF <laughs> is the group of institutos, fundações, and empresas. So be something similar to the Council of Foundations here. You know, uh, so they try to articulate. GIF is very corporate. Most of the foundations are corporate foundations, but there are some family foundations, which is a very new phenomenon in Brazil, growing in the past five years. But she's asking, what kind of articulations do you have with other funders? Yeah, I think it is important. This is why I'm asking. And I just want to add, for example, an example, uh, João Moreira Salles. He has now, I mean, he creates his own foundation, as his brothers also did. And uh, in this foundation is now uh, established in a very professional way. They have a president, they have a, a small team. So my question is, are you thinking to exchange? Partnerships with Institutos do Nature, not through my foundation, through the other foundation that I also help. But, but I sense that everybody wants to talk, but sometimes, and we have a common project that we, I think we combine and go. But uh, family, found their family philanthropies, there's a discretion of the family. 
Yeah. So and they choose different territories. Some some wants to be very fragmented. Sometimes they want to be very focused. So it's very for you to find a common ground is not easy. <laughs> Even when I visit here, Nova Foundation is the son of Warren Buffett, the Peter Buffett. They invest in 500 different projects in the U.S. Right, and, and we were very focused. Normally, we invest in one one thing, or, or we choose one project to be focused on, on one thing. And a foundation that uh, decides to fragment that much, I don't know how much of uh, contact you can have in what you're. Doing. But but it's an option of the maybe the impact is different. I don't want to criticize. I just think that the configurations, because it's at the discretion of the families, are very different. And also just to add, I think we're, we are in a very specific, like, small family foundation. So in Brazil, they usually have, like, you know, the companies or the families, like, more, like a bigger uh, foundation. And we are very kind of, like, niche, like, you know, very, like, small beginning. We are only, like, four years, so we don't have any kind of collaboration or... Uh, but something, I'm uh, sorry, no. just something that upset me very much is... Once was I was reading a book about the Rockefeller family and life, right? And the first Rockefeller, when he was still an accountant, <laughs> receiving $20 a day, he was donating 20% of his salary to philanthropy. Right? So uh, that's why a little bit, it's not how much money you have, it's the mindset that I think uh, I, I envy this country and I hope Brazil will move to a different thing, right? It's not because you don't have a lot doesn't mean that you to don't need to do something. So on, on that note, I also <laughs> want to thank them. Like when we invited them to be honored, the, her first reaction was like, no, they don't want to be in the spotlight. Or We must put people like them on the spotlight because more people can do, you know, you don't have to be the Rockefeller or Lehman. It, it doesn't matter the size of the foundation. It matters is the, the, the the attitude, is, it matters that more people do in you know, Brazil is, there is a lot of wealth in Brazil and um, you know, we are the eighth largest economy. It, it makes no sense that we are number 75 on giving. So uh, thank you for <laughs> accepting our homenaging tomorrow and for speaking here. I think we really need more more families like yours involving the, the second generation and learning and, and taking risks but also paying close attention to to the results and, and measuring and um, so thank you uh, one more question no, just Canada. to reinforce what uh, Patricia has been saying uh, about you that is right after we had the breakfast was really inspiring to see how you get involved just not uh, providing the financial support you want to know from the very from the other end who is the person that's going to be the beneficiary and, and in some cases you really follow the path of these people that are being uh, you know receiving your support so that's what really inspired us and we feel that is a, is a great example that you know of people that really spend time and dedication to to support in so many levels people that you know need support so we just like wanted to reinforce how uh, honored we are to have you guys at the Napa this year. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you both again, and uh, if if you wanna, you are happy, you are all welcome to stay and have a coffee and and chat. We are very happy tomorrow to be celebrating our 16th gala and honoring philanthropists and social entrepreneurs m moving Brazil forward. Thank you again, Ted and everyone at the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce for this opportunity. And um, thank you, each of you, for, for coming here this morning. We have people from London.